what I'm going to talk about is adaptive financing and uh, some crypto economic primitive that we have for this as well as a use case. Um, and so that impact certificate is from a, is for a um, Im implementer of a project called Chimple, um, which is live in India at the moment. It's um, distributed 500 tablet devices to 500 um, poor households that are using a learning uh, program on the device. Um, and these are children who um, you know, experienced uh, like not being able to go to school during the COVID um, uh, epidemic over the past couple of years. So the education level is really low. So we have 500 kids in this uh, pilot group, and then we have a, um, a uh, uh, control group as well, and we're collecting data on this over 12 months. And so how do we finance this? Um, so um, when we're talking about adaptive finance, it's really in the context of crypto economic mechanisms. Um, in general, crypto economic mechanisms are, are financial systems that are built on verifiable um, stateful data. And generally, most of the DeFi um, uh, crypto economic mechanisms, you know, the data is all just on-chain data. So your liquidity pool, etc. What we want to do is um, enable uh, DeFi to move to ReFi and to build uh, crypto economic systems that are um, suitable for funding uh, real projects and real state change in the world. And so, you know, this is a sort of general principle that um, blockchains enable reality um, to exist within software, and uh, what we would like to do is bring in this layer of um, enabling this reality as verified Earth state um, to be uh, existing within the software as validated chain state. And I'm going to show how that kind of kind of works. And so this can apply to finance, you know, so it can be um, I have made an investment in the real world, and it's reflected on chain. Um, it can be services, so I have uh, provided a service, and I'm getting a payment both the record of having provided the service as well as the payment transaction can be stored in, in some form uh, statefully on chain. Uh, data, the same thing, and ultimately um, it's about reflecting changes in the real world and changes in the, the blockchain. And when we bring this together, we have a cyber physical system. Um, and uh, where the state of the virtual system, the blockchain and its related technologies, uh, reflects or was linked to the, the change in the state of the physical world. Now, a very powerful idea here is that when changes in the, in the state of the real world create changes in the state of the chain, um, and when, uh, it, it can do that, okay, and when changes in the state of the chain happen, they can feed back as incentives to get people to change the state of the world. And so this feedback loop is super important. And this is where we need to look at, okay, well, how do we make it adaptive so that it is linked to reality? So what's the interface between state changes on chain, state changes in the real world? Um, so the basis of this, I'm gonna talk a little bit of um, the, the data side of things, and this feeds in really powerfully to the impact certificates um, uh, story. And so we've been working since uh, like 2015 on a protocol um, using decentralized identifiers, verifiable claims and credentials, um, to have um, a way of representing what's happening in the real world um, with identif identification, verifiability, um, creating these as verifiable claims, so signed, uh, si signed uh, claims, um, and then uh, verification with the verification proofs, which leads to the ability to, to issue credentials. And you can package those credentials together and put them into non-fungible impact tokens. Um, now, Impact tokens, you know, they're basically NFTs, but what we've worked on is a, um, a, a much more um, robust uh, metadata standard around this, which uses decentralized identifiers and, and, uh, and the dead documents, if for those of you who are familiar with the W3C specification. And so this has an identifier, and it has the crypto controls and so on of a dead document, um, but we've added in um, some additional properties here. And so, um, this makes these, um, these uh, impact tokens programmable because we can now embed services and services can be chain services, you know, data, data stores, um, uh, web two services, whatever services you'd like to put in there as endpoints essentially, uh, and then rights. So the rights can define what you can do with those services or they can be rights that are expressed in smart contracts or as legal contracts or um, uh, Delegated authorization, Z caps. 
Um, and embedded in these um, tokens is uh, the data, the verifiable credentials, the claims, um, and, uh, and general data as, as well. And you can link any resources to this. So now we've got a package of, um, of uh, digital assets that is not only an information carrier, but it's programmable and you can do really interesting things with it. And I'll get to that in the context of the educational uh, program in a minute. Um, and this really can be used for any classes. Um, so as Juan was saying earlier, um, you know, we have the ones that are obvious that are, are currently being um, digitized, uh, certificates such as carbon certificates, uh, <laughs> renewable energy certificates, and so on. Um, but really, we can represent any outcomes in the certified form. So whether it's uh, nature-based, health-based, industrial, um, IP, et cetera, any, basically anything that we care about um, and want to work towards, invest in, and, uh, and spend our money on. And because of the composability, this can be built into any financial transaction, um, any capital allocation, you know, government expenditures, business processes, consumer products, and so on. So you can, for instance, embed one of these tokens into a product as a proof that the product um, has a sustainable uh, source, for instance. Uh, so coming back to our use case example of the Chimple Pilot, um, so we've implemented this crypto economic primitive that we've developed called an alpha bond, and that's the adaptive financing bit, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail there. Um, and this is a, a project that we, we're running, uh, currently collecting the data um, uh, in partnership with Chimpool and UBS Bank. Um, so if we just take a step back and say, okay, well, what are we trying to achieve in this project? Um, it's, from, from an investor perspective, investors want to achieve alpha, and if it, they're impact investors, it's impact alpha, so it's a, um, we want to have better than market average um, returns in terms of the, the impact that's uh, achieved, as well as financial returns. And the balance between the impact and the finance kind of gives you the, the, um, the alpha. But in addition to this, when we think of this in the context of a, a whole system, we're wanting to reduce um, the negative externalities, such as the dependency that gets created um, through these, these types of financing mechanisms. And we want to in increase positive externalities, such as strengthening the education services. And this can be done by decentralizing, actually enabling the financing to happen at a local level, enable local stakeholders to get involved, rather than this being in the way that uh, actually what this, what this specific bond is, um, is, uh, uh, is demonstrating a replacement for is a very large development impact bond for 300,000 kids in India, which UBS is, is implementing. Um, which is very centralized, the capital is formed in Zurich, and everything is kind of done from there, lots of intermediaries, very high costs, uh, and, and so on. Um, and then we want to ensure that, um, that the project failure rate is low. Um, and uh, having worked in, in the development sector for most of my career, um, so many projects fail. You know, they just don't deliver what they were supposed to deliver, and generally we find out after the fact and there's no course correction and so on. And so we really wanna make this a more successful way of funding um, in terms of the outcomes that get achieved. Now, um, there's this interface that we need between um, the real world and, and the, the blockchain, and so what is that interface? You know, so it's like the interface in our car is, a, is basically the, uh, the um, accelerator, and we can see some data about how fast we're going and so on. And so the interface is a token bonding curve. Um, now for those of you, most of you know about bonding curves, how they work, you know, you buy into the curve, it mints the tokens, um, you burn to sell out of the curve, there's parametric pricing depending on the, the curve parameters. And what this does is regulate supply and, um, and demand in a sort of automatic, automated market making kind of way. The shortcomings of um, bonding curves as they've mostly been implemented, are that you have fixed a priori um, assumptions. So your parameters for the curve, you kind of set them and then you can't change them. The, the curve is kind of just gonna be whatever shape and whatever uh, configuration you've set out uh, at, at the start in a, in a smart contract. Um, and they're not good at responding to new information. The only new information is whether there's a buy or a sell. But they have no other ways of uh, seeing what's going on on chain or, or kind of sensing what's going on in the real world. And for most bonding curves, they work because of ponzinomics. Um, and uh, 
to the previous speaker's um, examples, you know, it's kind of that cancer curve um, as opposed to the sigmoidal you know, kind of uh, um, a curve that has an endpoint. Um, and so um, what's useful about um, having a pricing mechanism like this is that it can incorporate a lot of information. So this is the first of two uh, high uh, quotes that I really like and I'm going to um, uh, present here. So, you know, prices are an instrument of communication that gives us a lot of information that um, that uh, we don't necessarily directly have. So, knowing the price of the bond and corresponding that to the project and its um, success and its performance is uh, really helpful. Um, so, uh, this is thanks to Zagam and uh, his team, so a good systems um, design and, uh, and analysis. Um, so, we did a, a year-long project with Block Science and um, came up with this mechanism of risk-adjusted bonding curves. And so, there's two parts to this mechanism. The one part is um, a bonding curve, but that changes its parameters based on an input of alpha. So, alpha is predicting between zero and one the probability of a future pay up, uh, payoff. So if the um, impact bond is going to pay back um, $100,000 and um, risk investors are putting in um, you know, $80,000 to implement, the pro to fund the project, um, over time, uh, the uh, continuous funding that um, is brought in through this, uh, through this mechanism adjusts the price to whether the project is going to achieve its outcome payment or not. Is it going to achieve its result and then uh, a payoff? Now, th that payoff can be anything. It can be through the production of uh, impact tokens or impact certificates, or it can be a, you know, a financial agreement that if you achieve this, um, uh, this target or this, this uh, milestone, then you'll get paid. The other part of this is um, a prediction market. Um, now, we haven't implemented this in code yet, and so it hasn't been tested out in any sort of real-world context. Um, but uh, the prediction market part of this allows for the participants who hold bond tokens to take positions in success and failure pools. Um, so it works like a typical prediction market, uh, except that it's um, with people who have skin in the game. So, you know, you're, you're, you're an investor and you're participating in the prediction market. Um, this is particularly useful for but most projects that don't have secondary markets, you know, so if, if you've got a large project and you've got a lot of tokens out there and there's liquidity pools and they're sort of trading on the secondary market, then you've got a price indicator of um, essentially a prediction market uh, providing feedback as to the value of the underlying um, uh, project. Whereas in this way, um, uh, you don't have to have a secondary market. You can have the primary participant in this primary issuance mechanism participating in the, in the prediction market. Now, these things do come at a cost, you know, so if you're going to operate a prediction market, you have to have some additional capital um, to, uh, to operate that mechanism um, that can't be used for the project implementation. So that's just one of the, one of the downsides of this. Um, and this, this updates um, through, a, um, um, uh, through, through basically like updating priors um, um, through a Markov chain mechanism. And so you kind of get a smoothing out over time. So as new signals are coming in on alpha, it's, it's adjusting the system alpha um, to provide a prediction on whether the, the outcome is going to be achieved. And so um, this serves as a sort of game, um, people participating in this uh, options market, this prediction market, and that provides an, an estimation of, of alpha. And uh, so here's the other Hayek uh, quote, um, that prediction markets are mechanisms for collecting vast amounts of information by individuals and synthesizing this into a useful data point, data point here being alpha. So this is what it looks like, um, sort of schematically. Um, so we have an alpha bond, um, which uh, takes in investor capital and a continuous funding um, mechanism and uh, mints tokens, bond tokens, uh, as those investments are made into the reserve. Um, that sets the bond price. It's one of the one of the main things that sets the price is the, is the current reserve. Um, uh, that's the relationship um, between supply and reserve, and uh, and then that um, uh, the curve gets repriced based on this prediction that's coming in this alpha value. And so, if the project's doing well. You know, the price goes up. If the project's not doing well, the price goes down. And what this effectively does is, is, is dilutes the, all, all investors because 
to having to issue more tokens um, at a lower price in order to achieve the, the, the funding target. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, this should, this can produce impact tokens or we can just uh, produce an outcome payment and uh, that then repays the investors. Um, so yeah, this is kind of what it looks like um, in the in the Chimple example on our software. So you know, um, we've got the curve happening there. In our case, we're not using a prediction market. We're using a signal that's coming in from the tablet devices. So we've got um, software on the tablet device that is issuing claims, um, signing claims. So basically, the device is saying um, the, the student used used me and got to this level in in the educational program. And we use that as a, a signal for uh, calculating the alpha on a continuous basis. Um, and those claims come in and get, and get verified and so on. Um, and so um, here's an example of an education token um, that uh, could, be, could be issued. This is conceptual. We're not actually issuing these tokens um, for, the, for the kids. But here we have you know, the, an idea that services could be that based on this token, you could get a personalized learning curriculum. Um, uh, access to learning software, et cetera. Um, you may have rights um, to get an educational bursary, for instance, if you've achieved this accomplishment. And linked resources can be qualification credentials, very verified attendance claims, et cetera. Um, so this information unit becomes um, usable, um, programmable, and it's, and it's also data uh, rich, um, and so is a, is a valuable asset. Um, so um, the vision with this is, you know, that this provides an, auton an autonomous, replicable, adaptive, and safe mechanism. So it's designed that it has parameters that you can't go um, outside of. And uh, the, the big vision here is that we um, can enable much greater capital flows to happen through debt finance or through this um, mobilizing capital um, that uh, can uh, achieve regulatory um, approval because these are essentially securities. You know, um, so if you're issuing bonds for uh, uh, um, investing in solar uh, solar panel installations or for education or for whatever the bond's going to be for, um, essentially that's a security that you're issuing with some promise of future return. Um, and I believe that um, if we collect enough data and uh, verify the mechanism is safe, it should get regulatory approval. Uh, that this can really just be automatically um, uh, issued. And the, the analogy here is uh, drones. You know, so the, this picture is a, is, a, is a picture taken of a drone swarm, which is now um, permitted. You can get a license to fly swarms of drones, and the Federal a Aviation Authority en enables this because drones have control mechanisms, and there's all these sort of safety um, mechanisms in, in, in place. And so that's the sort of analogy. Um, for scaling. Um, yeah, so uh, this is just a kind of bonus um, slide, uh, just talking about adaptive finance in the context of, uh, of the commons um, and really applying you know, the principles of, um, of the commons to this, um, that adaptive finance can be used to serve the commons, to build new economies and, uh, and, uh, and use feedback systems. Um, and uh, I won't go into all the uh, all the little bits in, in here, but you're welcome to get this a copy of this slide if it's interesting to you. So, yeah, thank you very much.